we talked about learning, uh, some of the forms of learning, and now we'll talk about memory, how you uh, store that learning. So memory, uh, unified, by the way, is much bigger than just memory. Unified is about cognition, so it's a lot of uh, processes like memory, all the types. Um, it's also about problem solving, creativity, what else is it about? Intelligence, intelligence tests. So uh, a lot of the frontal lobe uh, activities here. Uh, the memory is not just frontal lobe activity, but uh, cognition is a large part of that. So obviously you take in the uh, information, the sensory information, but you're uh, processing. A lot of your cognition takes place in the frontal lobe. All right, so you find cognition, and we are talking uh, for this notebook page, and maybe the next one, I can't remember exactly, but uh, it's about memory. So memory is, of course, if you learn something and it stays with you, that, then it becomes a memory. Um, that's what it means to learn something and, and memorize it and, and use it and remember it. Uh, so that's learning that's persisting over time. Persisting over time. Otherwise, you lost memory. It, it wasn't encoded or stored or retrieved um, correctly, and so you, you lost the memory. Uh, but we'll get to that in a bit. So um, we start first, I think, with the explicit implicit. Yes. Um, so there's, there's more than two types exactly, but uh, we can kind of reduce the categories at least uh, to two branches or two types. So there's explicit, uh, which means clear, like clearly stated, uh, and that's kind of what the, uh, it, it represents. So explicit memory and implicit memory. All right, uh, which one do you think is my conscious information that I would uh, be able to recite to you and explain. Explicit. Yeah, the explicit. Implicit is the one that I learn it, and I know it, I memorized it, it's part of what I can do, uh, but it's more so like skill-based, movement-based, procedural-based. So this is like, I learned to walk at, at a certain age, and so did all of you for the most part. Um, so when um, I'm walking, am I consciously thinking about how I walk, or do I just do it? You're just doing it, right. So uh, the implicit memory is much more procedural based, procedural uh, or skill based. It absolutely might have been explicit at one point, like when you're learning it. That's what we'll talk about effortful processing. Um, oh, in fact, I should specify between those two because that, that confuses a lot of groups. Processing is when you're taking the information in. It's much more closer to what you call learning. Uh, this is when you've already got it and it's stored already, and then you're using it, all right? So the uh, processing part, which we'll get to effortful and uh, um, automatic, right, is the two, yeah. Uh, that's where you're trying to learn it and encode it in your memory, and this is when you already possess it. Uh, you already have the information, the skill, you're, you're, you're now using it. So implicit is, again, mostly my procedural stuff, <coughs> skill-based things, um, like when I learn to kick a soccer ball properly, or well, uh, or throw a football, or catch, uh, catch or throw a baseball, all those things, play tennis, uh, swing correctly, serve correctly, uh, or at least well. Those are all skills I have to learn, all right? I don't, I might explicitly know what I'm supposed to do, but when I actually carry it out and use the skill, my brain's not consciously telling my arms what to do and my legs what to do. It's just being automatically done uh, as I perform the task. Now again, I could explain how to ride a bike, but when I'm riding the bike, I'm not sitting there trying to remember how to ride a bike every time. I just hop on and go. Uh, it just, it happens without me um, having to think about it, all right? Um, as I'm moving around and using my arms here, now I'm thinking about it, but as, when I talk, I move my arms. Occasionally I move around, I use my legs. Uh, what kind of memory is that that I'm using as I'm talking to you guys? Why is it implicit? You're right, why is it implicit? Yeah, it's unconscious. I'm not even aware that I'm doing it. I might have like a, some sort of drive or thought to go over here, but then when I start going there, I'm not like consciously telling my legs to move, uh, each, each muscle to expand and contract, each ligament to expand and contract. I'm not doing that. It's happening automatically. Um, this can also be classical conditioning type stuff, associations. So not only is it procedural based stuff, like walking, moving, throwing, things like that, skill based, but it's also associations where my body automatically responds to something. Um, so, that's all stored, I'll say associations too, associations, and again, these are automatic responses. Uh, for example, when a dog smells food, 
and they salivate, they're not aware of, they're not like, all right, time to be, initiate the salivation process. It just happens automatically. Uh, those types of memories, implicit memory, is largely stored in the thing that looks kind of like a smaller brain, uh, your uh, cerebellum there in the back, uh, force, back lower portion. So that's stored in the cerebellum. And we know this because people lose procedural skills uh, when they have damage to their cerebellum. And they also lose the ability to automatically react to things, like have reactions, basically. So here's what I mean. Uh, if, if I took you guys and I, I put you on this uh, experiment where you're sitting there, and then you're in front of this machine, and every time a light goes on, it, it like sprays water in your face, just like, like a little bit. All right. Um, the first time, you're not ready for it. So you just get you're gonna hit with water. Uh, the second time, hopefully you become aware of it. Uh, but certainly by the third, fourth, or fifth time, your body's automatically gonna respond to the uh, light going on, and you're gonna brace yourself for that, that splash of water. All right, what, what is that? Is that classical conditioning or operant conditioning? <coughs> classical, why? With the, there we go, thanks. Why don't you just close that, because you're clearly just watching videos this whole time. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, again, tell me why. I think it was, it was you. Because you start associating the light with uh, water. Yeah, exactly. And then I'm having this kind of, uh, un, or I'm having this kind of conditioned response to it, where my, my, my face kind of prepares for the, the spray. I could possibly consciously stop it, right? Just like how if someone comes up to you and swings at your face but doesn't hit it, you like, close your eyes, but you know, if, if they're doing it intentionally, you might be able to not close your eyes because you're consciously stopping it. But that automatic stuff, those associations, those are in your cerebellum. So the reason why we know this is if uh, people have damaged their cerebellum or, uh, well, we'll just say there's a lesion or something, uh, or they have uh, a concussion or swelling, whatever it might be, uh, they can lose some of these abilities. So even though I've, uh, been doing like, for example, I take somebody who has their cerebellum damage and I put them in front of that machine, the light goes on and it sprays them with water. They're not gonna automatically respond to that. They might be able to consciously respond to it, uh, but they won't, aren't able to make that association automatic, uh, which is a weird phenomenon. And you can also uh, lose some of your procedural memory uh, skills, whether it's uh, walking or bike riding, or whatever it might be, because a lot of that is largely in your cerebellum. Um, this is why I didn't like them putting biofeedback into uh, the last section. I like it better here for, for not for learning, but for memory. It could go in either, they're very close. But the biofeedback uh, theory is, let's say I do lose my ability uh, to walk biofeedback uh, theory, or learning, let's say learning. But we could call it memory too. Uh, this is where, let's say I do have damage to my cerebellum and I lose the ability to walk for whatever reason. Maybe it's my spinal cord, but whatever. I lose my ability uh, to walk and do procedural things. Um, I can actually move my limbs consciously, uh, and that's the biofeedback theory. So let's say, again, I have an accident, I have some brain damage, and I no longer uh, can move my left arm, uh, or I can't do a specific task like brush my teeth or whatever. Um, we found that because you do have voluntary movement in your motor cortex, you can actually look at, and for, for whatever reason you have to look at it, you can't just do it automatically. Like I can, you know, grip my hands and use things without looking at it. But if I lost my uh, procedural memory ability, there's a way if I use my voluntary uh, movement in the portion of my motor cortex, I can look at my arm and actually use it uh, to some extent. So it's not completely entirely gone. But the brain is weird how it works. Um, it's not just like in there somewhere or in, in anywhere, it's, it's in one part. So if it breaks down, has a lesion or whatever, uh, it can really impair you in a weird, weird way. Which is why, did I tell you guys about the, uh, no, I think that's actually, I talked about that tomorrow, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. Um, there uh, is a, crap, I forgot what the phenomenon's called. Uh, it's when they damage the hippocampus and they can't make new memories or, oh, prosopagnesia, I've told you about that one. Uh, where if you have damage to your feature receptors, you can't recognize faces. Even though you know the person, you can't recognize the face. It's just a weird phenomenon that, uh, that, that just shows how weird our brains are. Uh, this is similar to that. So again, if I damage this, I can lose some of my procedural memory and ability, but if I look at it and use my conscious uh, motor uh, movement skills, I can still possibly use the limb, as weird as that sounds, uh, but that's how it works. So uh, most of the stuff you're doing without thinking, even me talking right now, like the, me using the words that I'm using uh, is actually 
part of uh, what you could call implicit memory. It's not necessarily the cerebellum, uh, but I'm not, I'm not consciously using the uh, meaning of the words, but I'm consciously using the words. That one's more complex. It's easy to just remember associations and procedural memory for implicit. So what's explicit then? It's like using your conscious consciousness or like whatever you're doing. Okay, give me an example of memory that is uh, a conscious effort, a full uh, explicit statement of something. I'm using it right now, by the way. Smiling? <coughs> no, I'd say that smiling could be implicit. If Actually, you make me happy, I'm just going to smile without thinking about it. Almost certainly, I'm trying not to, you know. So like thinking about an answer? Okay, yeah, exactly. So uh, what's, I usually give like, you know, the, the examples like capital of the United States of, of America. So like, I would be like, I'd have to consciously think about what that was and then state it. That's an explicit memory, all right? It's not something that I do automatically, like walking or, or uh, forming an association. So this is anything that I uh, consciously <coughs> recall uh, and then state, think, uh, or do. Uh, but spe specifically the first two. All right, so anytime I'm stating facts, my mother's name is, you know, uh, I'm going to go to wherever, or I've already done this, or the answer to that question is this. That's all uh, explicit memory of you storing it uh, and putting it back out there. And that's part of that, uh, what we talked about last week. This would be an example of semantic memory uh, where you are. No, actually, it could be both. I'm not going to say that because you could actually explain to me an episodic uh, uh, memory as well. Because you could explain to me something that happened to you specifically, like on the day, what it was like, uh, and that's still explicit as well, so I won't bring that one up. But yeah, uh, consciously recalling and exploiting, and this is just doing something automatically or forming an association automatically. Um, one example I had was uh, when I used to go to the Costco here uh, in Manteca. Uh, I don't anymore, just because I, I, I don't live near it, now I'm in Modesto. But um, when I uh, um, would go up to the carts, for whatever reason, I, it must have been the floor at that Costco because it doesn't happen at the other Costco. I would get shocked by the damn cart every time. So like my brain would automatically remember after I got shocked a couple times, I would go to grab the cart and then my hand would automatically stop without me even thinking about it because it knew a shock was coming. Uh, that would be an example of an implicit memory. I'm not thinking like, oh, it's going to shock me. Uh, I go to grab it and I get a weird feeling in my hands and I pull back and then I can remember, oh yeah, this thing shocks me. Uh, so I first get the implicit, and then I remember it and recall it as the explicit. All right. Um, hopefully that made some sense of the differentiation between, differentiation between the two. Okay. So um, I know short-term memory is not necessarily on the um, this notebook page is on the next one, but uh, I do want to mention it here because this process is a short-term process. So you do have short-term and long-term. That makes sense. Short-term stuff that you temporarily store and it goes away quickly. Long-term is obviously stuff you keep with you for extended periods of time. Um, like if I were to give you a sequence of numbers like 1, 7, 9, 28, 57, 3, 2, uh, you can remember some or all of those numbers I just gave you. Are you going to remember them an hour from now? No. So would it be an example of long-term memory? No, that's just short-term memory. Um, the reason why I say this is as we're taking in information and processing, which I'll explain next, that's all part of the short-term memory process. All right, so I'm going to focus on this for a second. So short-term memory. Everything you take in has to be stored <coughs> temporarily. And then depending on the information and what it means to you, uh, you're likely to remember it and that make it part of your long-term memory. All right, because I, I say a lot of things to you guys every day. Uh, and you remember some of them, but some of them just, you, may, you might remember after I say it and then there it goes, you know, after the, the bell rings or even before that. Uh, that's short-term memory, uh, which is later stored as um, uh, long-term so short-term memory, uh, here's kind of the process that you go through to remember something. So you have to experience it uh, in some way. I mean, you could have a thought, I suppose, that's void of experience, but let's pretend I'm learning something from my environment. I'm listening to somebody or watching something. So uh, I'm going to sense it, right? So I get the sense, sense re input, right? I see it or hear it or feel it, whatever it might be. Uh, and you, we know that process. You take it through your eyes, your ears, and you, almost all of it goes through your uh, thalamus, and then it goes to the various cortex, which interprets it. Then you choose to, uh, uh, then, then it becomes a part of your memory system, whether it's short-term or long-term. 
all right? Uh, so, so a sensory input, then it goes to your thalamus, then it goes to whatever cortex for interpretation. Uh, and this is where it's kind of simultaneously becomes part of your memory. Where almost all memories go first is uh, in your limbic system. Uh, it's called your hippocampus. Uh, it's, a, it's almost kind of like a halo if you look at it, the actual piece. Uh, but it's the part that, for whatever reason, holds that temporary information and then stores it or not in long-term memory. All right, so when you see these things, sensory input, thalamus goes to the cortex region, uh, but then it's also going to the hippocampus, hippocampus, and that's going to store it, if it's long-term, if it's explicit, uh, either in your uh, cortex regions or association areas, basically just the cortical on the outside of your brain, or your uh, cerebellum, depending on what, you know, if it's an implicit or an explicit uh, memory <coughs> that's being stored. <coughs> that's the process, all right? So um, what might happen to me if I get in an accident, this actually happened to my friend, by the way. Uh, he, no, he didn't get in an accident. We were uh, at um, Snow Globe a few years ago, and um, we, uh, it, it was icy, and we don't know what the hell my friend was doing. Uh, we were at the hotel, we were having hot chocolate, we just arrived, or maybe it was the second day. Maybe it was the second day. Uh, regardless, we're uh, drinking hot chocolate in the lobby, and despite all of us being there, he randomly walks off in the parking lot by himself, and we're like, where the hell did he go? Uh, so we walk out, and uh, I see in the distance this stumbling guy walking towards us. I'm like, okay, somebody's clearly drunk or something, uh, but it's him. And I'm like, well, I know he's not drunk. He just had hot chocolate and nothing else. Uh, and he's like stumbling over and laughing and holding the, the wall as he's coming over. And I'm like, and he's, he starts talking. He's laughing. He's not making any sense. I'm like, dude, he's got a concussion. Did you fall? Uh, and sure enough, uh, we follow him out. And then there's this hot chocolate on the ground and his, uh, uh, his uh, beanie on the ground. He like slipped on the ice on uh, this grassy part of the hill and hit his head. Um, so he had a concussion. And he, for about a day and a half, maybe two, could not form new memories, couldn't do it. Uh, I probably answered this question like 30 times. He kept saying, why does my head hurt? He would like, we'd explain it to him, be like, you fell out there, and he'd be like, oh, okay. And then we'd sit there and like 30 seconds later, he's like, oh, my head hurts, what happened? Like over and over and over, and he couldn't remember it. He eventually got it back. So I don't know exactly what was wrong, but <coughs> likely that because of the impact, there was some sort of inflammation that probably, I can't be certain, probably affect his hippocampus, because uh, that's the thing that takes the short-term info uh, and would store it. So there was some form of error there, because he could not make any new memories. He could recall things from before the, 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 the accident, but anything from the accident to about, like I said, day and a half, two days later, he could not remember. He doesn't remember it at all, actually. His memory of the event is, we went to the hotel and had hot chocolate, then nothing, and then two days later, he was in the hospital uh, going home. He's fine, by the way, now, except he can't smell as well for some reason, so. Which is uh, another piece of evidence that says it's in the limbic system, because that's where your smell goes through, so it would make sense. Regardless, um, that's kind of the process. So you take the information, hippocampus, and that's gonna be uh, distributing it, the short-term memory, into your uh, cortical regions or your uh, cerebellum for storage. Now, here's the thing I want to make clear uh, about the working memory, uh, the amendment to the old notes that I put up there. Uh, working memory is kind of synonymous with short-term memory. It's almost the same thing, but it's not quite the same thing. So it's just like short-term. And this, this can confuse people. If you get confused, don't worry. It's a, it's a complex uh, concept. But one helpful way, perhaps, is uh, if you have really good working memory, it's got a really, really, really high correlation with IQ, intelligence. Uh, and the reason why is this is your ability to be listening to me talk or whatever and remember the stuff I said in the short term so you can keep listening and tie it back to what I said. So here's an example. If I were to be giving you directions, uh, do you have to remember the whole sequence of directions? Yes. Probably, or at least most of it. So if I say, oh, you turn here and turn to this thing, then you go to this thing, you turn to this thing, you go back to this thing on the way back and turn to this thing, you'd have to remember that sequence I gave you, otherwise it's useless, right? If you remember the last few I gave you, it doesn't matter because you missed the other streets that would get you there. Um, so one of the reasons why, they think anyway, people with higher IQ uh, have a good working memory is when they're reading something or learning something or thinking about something, they can keep 
like this temporary little bubble of information in their head uh, to try to figure the problem out. Um, so a good way to test this is uh, to just see how many numbers you can memorize in a short amount of time. Like there's actually programs and apps that can do this where they'll show you like eight numbers for like a second and then you have to recall what the eight numbers were. Uh, and the more you can remember in that short window of time, the better your, your working memory is. Uh, another good example is if I already give you a phone number and I just go like, oh, 209-847-5131. Uh, uh, your ability to remember that for a long time, you're all trying now. Um, your ability to remember that for a long time uh, would be uh, your working memory, essentially. Um, and then, um, and again, for, uh, it's, it seems to be correlated uh, quite highly, positively, positively correlated uh, at a really high um, uh, uh, correlation coefficient uh, with IQ. Uh, and I think, again, that's why. Because if I'm talking to you about something complex, you have, to remember all this, you have to remember all the stuff I said to comprehend the whole thing and think about it and give an answer or, or, or try to you know, attribute to the, uh, the, the talk or the idea. So that's what working memory is. If you want to think of it as short-term memory, Great, uh, it's not exactly what it is, but that's partly what it is. All right, so it's, again, think of it as like, you can kind of temporarily keep this little bubble of information in your head while you're talking to somebody uh, and keep using that little bubble of information. Like, oh, well actually you said this before or, or, or whatever. That's largely working memory. All right, so do we uh, kind of understand working memory? How can I test it? Exactly right, and, and by the way, because uh, you can use tricks and mnemonics to improve it, uh, I just mean your ability to remember the numbers themselves. If you start giving numbers meanings, because this is how, by the way, people have memory champions where they like memorize 300 something odd letter sequences. Uh, what they do is they attach meanings to the letters or numbers. So like, they wouldn't just see one, two, seven, eight, seven, six, five, four, eight, two, two. They, they, I even said, threw a letter in there on accident. Um, they wouldn't just remember that sequence of numbers. To them, like each number represents like a face, so they think of people's faces and they turn into a story as they listen. That's not the same thing. That's just a trick for memorizing stuff. Uh, but if you can just remember the the number sequence like that, uh, that's uh, a good example of that. So speaking <coughs> of uh, processing information, there's uh, two types. There's effortful. And effortless, no, just kidding, it's automatic. <coughs> uh, this is actually pretty easy. So again, processing means I'm trying to store it into memory, all right? Um, some of you might just be able to listen to me say stuff and remember it for the quiz well enough for the FRQ. Congrats to you. Uh, but I would bet that even the best of you that can do that can't do it perfectly. So if you want to get a really good grade, you probably have to study to some extent. All right, that is where you're intentionally trying to learn something. That's effortful processing. Uh, you are, it obviously requires effort. You are attempting to consciously, to consciously uh, remember something. Um, I'm using a bunch of words right now. They're just flying out at you. Are you thinking about every individual word that I'm using? No, you just understand it, correct? You're processing it without effort. All right, that's an example of automatic processing. It's where I'm just taking information, but I'm not having to consciously think about each one. Like the words I'm using, unless I use, you know, sophisticated vocabulary, if I'm using just basic uh, English words, you can understand what I'm saying like in real time. You're not thinking about every little word I used and what it means. All right, that's an example of automatic processing is uh, uh, processing language meaning <coughs> without effort. All you have to do is listen. You're not thinking about every individual word that comes out of my mouth. You just automatically know what it means. Now, hold on a second. Was there, or no, was there at one point in your time in your life you had to effortful, effortfully process the words I'm using? Yeah, that's what you're doing as you're an infant and a toddler, like you're learning the words and then using them. Like my son's doing that right now. He's just, he just is saying green today for the first time. So he's really trying to remember the word, how it sounds, what it's associated with, and how to say it, right? Uh, and it's super cute because he's only, he just turned nine months old. So like when he's learning, he can't just say the word, he's go like, goo, goo, goo. Like it's just, 
It's adorable, man. Uh, but anyways, uh, it's taking effort. But after you know uh, a while, like he can already say mom and dad and brother and all these things without thinking about it. He just says it. Now it's uh, for him anyway, automatic. But he does at one point, just like you all do, have to consciously try to remember the meaning of certain words. So that's the difference. And I want to real quickly show you this difference before we, we, we wrap it up here. This is when I've already got the information. It's already a part of my memory. I'm not trying to learn it. This is the processing part. part. That's when I'm trying to actually learn the info. So studying for a test versus just listening to somebody talk using words you already know. Does that make sense? All right, cool. So then uh, when I remember it, this is the one that I can explain to you, call from memory, and this is the one that I do without thinking about it. Got it? Stuff on, we're talking about memory, we talked about, I briefly intro it short term, we're gonna look at it again, but working memory, we did the processing, effortful and automatic, and then explicit, implicit. Okay, cool. So, regarding memory, so we're still in five, cognition, <coughs> and we're still talking about memory. And we're going ahead with our talking about processing it. So I already talked about effortful and automatic. So effortful, again, is when you're like attempting to learn something. Automatic is when you just uh, learn it without um, consciously attempting to necessarily. Or you're, you're, sorry, not learning it, processing it. So effortful processing is when you're trying to memorize it. Uh, automatic processing is when, is when I'm like giving out words and you all automatically know the meaning. You're not thinking about the individual words that are coming out of my mouth. Okay, so for me to actually store these memories, there's a, a sort of like a three-step process, and I think I use the example of like the warehouse, right? Okay, so there's uh, three processes here. Uh, there's encoding, which is uh, processing, taking the mess, uh, uh, information in, or the thought, and then you are going to store it uh, within your network of neurons in your uh, cerebral cortex. No specific location, by the way, but uh, just in your cerebral cortex and or cerebellum. And then uh, if you need to use that information, uh, whether it's automatic or uh, uh, explicitly, um, you are going to, uh, that's the retrieval part, retrieval. All right, so placing it, keeping it for storage, and then retrieving it when you go to use it. All right, um, so which, as the sensory information comes in, whether it's eyes, ears, whatever, whatever type of uh, way it's coming to your brain. Thalamus, cerebral cortex, whatever lobe it is, that whether it's occipital, temporal, whatever. Um, what's the mechanism in my brain or the part of my brain that has a large role in temporarily holding the information short term and then uh, encoding it into my cerebral cortex or at least aiding with it? Hippocampus. Yeah, hippocampus, right, the limbic system, correct. So a lot of this process is uh, not so, uh, solely, it's not singularly the role of the hippocampus, but it does play a large role in it. All right, uh, and a lot of the storage and retrieval is going to be uh, focused in around the cerebral uh, cortex, but again, the hippocampus does play a role there too. So the processing or the encoding, this is again like a warehouse. All right, so this is where the workers in the warehouse are like taking the, whatever it is, the box, whatever it is. Uh, and they're taking it from the truck or from the factory and they're going to go put it into the warehouse. So this is the guy in the forklift uh, going and picking up the uh, information. So what's the storage then? What? Yeah, organizing it and, and keeping it in place. So like if I have a giant warehouse and I'm just randomly putting boxes in places, am I gonna be able to retrieve them? <coughs> No, not efficiently anyway. Uh, I won't be able to like locate them because it's just a bunch of boxes. I've got to organize it, right? So I can, when I want to uh, retrieve something to be used or sold or put on a truck to be transported, I can be like, okay, it's located here. And I go to that spot and I pull it back out. So that's the storage is uh, organized uh, location slash, uh, uh, I'm gonna use the word storage in the word storage of keeping information. Okay, and then when I go to use information, like I say, well, the standard example, capital of the United States, Washington, D.C. <coughs> uh, basically what's happened is when I was young, 
I learned the information, so it was stored somewhere in my brain, in my network of neurons, uh, and I know where it is to recall, so then when I do want to use the information, uh, I do just end up retrieving it. So basically, it's like the uh, um, uh, warehouse worker like locating on their computer or whatever, <coughs> wherever it is, going to get the forklift and bring it out to sell it or use it or put it on a truck. All right, it's the exact same uh, sequence, I guess you could say. So this is, of course, uh, recalling or using, slash using information. All right, or the skill, whatever it might be. So that's the three, sort of three-step process. Taking it in, storing it somewhere you can actually retrieve it, and then of course when you go to use it, retrieving that information. That's the three-step process. And the reason why I bring this up is you can have errors, types of amnesia, you know, forgetfulness, in any one of these steps. You could fail to encode it, you could fail to store it properly, uh, or you can fail to retrieve the information. Uh, there's errors in each parts of, these, of this process. You with me on that so far? All right, cool. So next we would talk about the types of retrieval or, or memory I can have. So if I want to retrieve the memory, there's sort of three ways I can go about doing that. I can sort of pull it out of my brain. I can just recall it out of nowhere, right? That's just recall, so <coughs> memory abilities. Or retrieval, I should say. Uh, there's three ways I can do it. There's just recalling it straight from memory with no aids or help. Like you just say, oh, what's the answer to this? And I just tell you. Um, what would be the example of uh, that on a test? Multiple choice, fill in the blank. What would it be? Fill in the blank. Why? Because you're just recalling the information you would fill in if you were asked the question. Yeah, just to answer the question exactly. So this is like on a test, they fill in the blank in blank question. Right, I don't have like a word key or it's not multiple choice and I, I can't use my notes. I just have to like draw it out of memory on my own, which can be very difficult. It's cool when you get you paid for that one. Um, so what would the multiple choice one be like then? What type of memory, which I haven't listed here yet, but there's another one in the back really. What? Recognition. Recognition. Why is that like a multiple choice? Yeah, the answer's in front of you, you just have to locate the correct one. So it's like, here's several answers, which one is it? And you go, oh, that's the right one. That's recognizing. That's generally easier, which is why um, multiple choice tests, these scores are often better than a fill in the blank test, which you guys know, I'm sure. If you have my history, it was fill in the blank, and then this is more multiple choice based, and I'm sure your quiz grades are substantially better. In fact, I know they are, because I can see them. Um, all right, there's another one too, uh, where I maybe do, forget, or maybe I stored it improperly or, or, or whatever, um, and I'm having difficulty retrieving the information. I can learn about something again, and I can learn it and recall it much more quickly. What's that one called? Relearning. Yeah, that's relearning. Excellent. Relearning. Uh, this is a, a phenomenon where, well, here's an example. Let's say you had me or anybody, really, or world history, or AP world history. Well, we'll use AP world history specifically, because for AP world history, we do go over the major economic ideas throughout history, all right? The odds that two years later, your senior year, you'll come into my class again and perfectly remember all of them are pretty low. But compared to somebody who hasn't had my class before, you will learn it much more quickly and more effectively. Why? Because you already learned that information, so you're just trying to relearn it? Yes, you're, you're almost like, it's almost like you're remembering, your brain's recalling where it was stored so it can retrieve it. So you already have it there to some extent, or at least some understanding of it. So it's easier for you uh, to relearn it and remember it. So somebody learning from scratch is going to be at a disadvantage compared to somebody who's learned it previously in the past and maybe forgotten some, of all, some or all of it. You've all experienced this, I'm sure, in some class where you learn about something in junior high or your freshman or sophomore year, and then junior senior comes around and they're like, oh, blah, 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 they bring up a topic, you're like, oh, I remember that one, after they explain it and you, and you get it much faster than somebody who hasn't had that before. Uh, that's relearning. Uh, and these are all memory phenomena and ways you can do that, all right? Um, which is why it's important to be learning things constantly because even if you forget them, you can relearn them much more quickly because you remember some other parts of it or uh, it makes sense to you because you remember the structure of it or how it works together, networked with other things, uh, and so on. Okay, so 
If I want to memorize something, we gave two examples yesterday uh, for processing. Processing. Uh, remind me as to what those are if I'm processing information uh, for storage. There's the one where I have to try really hard, and then there's the one where it's just done without me even being necessarily aware of each individual bit of information. That's ritual and automatic. Which one's which? Obviously, the names kind of imply, but which one's which? Ritual is the one where you actually try, and automatic is like you're just getting to the information. Give me an example. Without being constantly. Everful is like you're studying for a test, and you actually are trying to like take these in and process them. Automatic is like you're talking to someone, and it's already going inside of your head without trying. No, yeah, you automatically process and comprehend it. So uh, the words that are coming out of my mouth or yours or whatever are written, most of them you already know. You don't have to think about, what does that word mean? Uh, was there at some point in your life a moment where you had to effortfully try to learn the words that I am using right now? Yes. Yes. Uh, so it, I think for the most part starts effortful, but after you get so familiar with it and you're constantly using this uh, retrieval system, it just, it just retrieves uh, <coughs> automatically and it becomes part of your network of understanding. You don't have to consciously think about every word. When new things come along, you do, uh, but for the most part, most of what you're getting from me or anything is automatic, like you already know it at your age. Uh, but some stuff is still effortful, like uh, the terms that I give here uh, are gonna be effortful. But later on in the year when I, when I call back to them and I'm using them, you just automatically understand them, not all of them obviously, but you do automatically understand them um, because you uh, understand them already. So what's an example? I'm sure there's something I've already used that I've used twice here. And the second time you're like, oh yeah, that thing. And I have to explain it to you again. What's one? What's something we've repeated here? Okay, the nature nurture stuff. I've talked about that at least a couple times, right? So when I talk about, when I say nature nurture, if I mentioned that the first day of class, you probably wouldn't know what I meant, right? You have to think about it. And at some point you did, I told you what it meant and gave you the history of it and we saw you know, the cycles of pro-nature, pro-nurture and whatnot. Now when I say it, you just, you might have to temporarily think about it, but you pretty much know what I'm talking about. Either explanations for behavior based on your environment or explanations for your behavior based on your biology and genetics. You already kind of understand. In fact, you actually understand a few of the key ideas behind each automatically without having to try to uh, memorize them. Uh, it's just drawn from your understanding already. All right, so that's, that's occurring constantly, where you have to learn it with effort, uh, and then you're just, it's part of your network of information, and it doesn't have to be explained anymore. All right, that's why it becomes hard, by the way, the more educated you become. You start using vocabulary and jargon from specific fields or sophisticated vocabulary, um, like you know, just bigger words, essentially. Uh, and you end up using them because they're automatic to you, but you know, younger folks or people that didn't learn that stuff, they have no idea what the hell you're talking about. So you go on talking about something specific about psychology, and then they don't understand three or four of the words you use, and they don't understand the entire sentence because of that. Um, so it's easy to fall into that trap. So like me as a teacher, I have to often remember, okay, wait on a second, that's a, a word they're probably not familiar with, or a concept they're not familiar with, so just slow down and explain it. So they're just blah, 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 talking about it, and you're like, I don't even know what it's talking about which happens anyway, but uh, you, you try to be conscious of it. <clears throat> All right, so there's actually ways that I can uh, process information that makes it easier to uh, encode, store, and retrieve. One way gives like a meaning or significance to the new concept or word, and one way is just purely trying to remember it with no meaning attached to it whatsoever. And I don't mean, by the way, top down, bottom up although it's related. Uh, what I'm talking about is processing, whether it's deep processing or shallow processing. Okay, so what I mean by uh, this is deep processing is the idea that you're more likely to remember something if it has some meaning to you, uh, whether it's context, or you make a story out of it, or you already know something about it, or you can relate it to something in your life or somebody else's life that you know, you're much more likely to remember that thing than if I just say, here's a word, here's what it means. All right, so if I said, uh, memorize this sequence of letters,
Um, what do you have to base that off of? Does it have any meaning to you? No, all you've got is like what it looks like essentially, or the sound. Uh, you're not gonna remember that. But if I gave you a sequence of numbers that was uh, close to your birthday, would you be more likely to remember that one? Why? Yeah, you'd be like, oh, that's just two days after my birthday. So you're gonna remember that much more easily. Uh, and that'd be an example of deep processing. So shallow processing is just, here's a bunch of numbers. All I've got to go off of them is what they look like or what they sound like. They have no meaning to me. But if I give you a set of numbers that looks very much like your birthday, it's just off by a couple, or it is your birthday, uh, you're gonna remember it without any effort or much less effort uh, because it has some meaning to you. All right, that's a pretty specific example, but it works. Uh, here's another one. If I were to uh, <coughs> give you a list of words, some of them are just the word, like we can't do this real time because you're gonna remember them because it's, your short term memory is pretty good. But let's say I gave you a list of words at the beginning of the week and I just said, here they are. One is uh, shirt, one is blonde, the other is table, the other is doll. The odds that you guys remember all four of those by the end of the week are pretty low. Like if I just said those four words and I didn't like let you write them down or tell you or be quizzed on them, I asked you a week later, the odds you remember all these are very, very low. But if I made this into a story, you'd be much more likely to remember it. Like I, if I said, oh, uh, a woman with a tie-dye shirt came in uh, with a, uh, uh, having just dyed her hair blonde for the first time, uh, and then she sat down at the table and started um, uh, repairing her daughter's doll that had been torn. The odds that you would remember at least some of those words are much more, they're much higher because I put them into a story. So did I give them meaning to you? I did, right? You'd remember something about that. You'd maybe remember the tie-dye shirt, maybe you remember the blonde ha hair, not haircut, hair dyeing, maybe remember her repairing the doll on the table, whatever it would be. You're more likely to remember some or all of these words if I put it into a story as opposed to if I just give you these four words. All right. Um, that's why I, when I make my uh, lesson plans, whether it's historically or psychologically, or whether it's history or psychology, I try to make it into a type of story or at least something that makes sense so you're not just learning a bunch of random terms. Like if I just said, here's a bunch of memory terms, here's a bunch of uh, disorder terms, here's a bunch of uh, 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 behaviorist terms. If I just randomly threw you terms all the year, would you have any good chance of remembering them? No, so how can I improve the chance that you're going to remember them? Don't just say give them meaning, by the way. You make it interesting and add examples. Okay, yeah, that actually really helps. Yeah, if, by adding examples, yeah, there's a reason why I give examples. It helps you understand it and remember it. In fact, what you're gonna find is a lot of times, uh, and I've, I've had this uh, told to me several times uh, after they take an AP test, they only remembered something because they remembered the example I gave. Like they didn't remember the specifics about self-discipline, but they remember the marshmallow test thing. So they were able to write about that and that helped them recall and elaborate and answer the question, right? So when you have some meaning to attach to it, whether it's a story uh, or whether I tell it in a logical order that builds on itself, um, which is what I try to do, um, that's gonna help you guys process and remember that information over time. Then if I just said, here's a list of terms, have fun. Uh, Cause we're gonna learn like, across the whole year, close to 600 terms. And but don't worry, you're already like 200 terms in, so. Um, but yeah, you wanna learn close to uh, five or 600 terms. And again, if I just said, all right, here's day one, here's a big list, memorize these 500 terms, we'll see you in May, you guys do terribly. Um, but you do better because I don't just make you learn those terms together, I find the ones that are common and go together and usually are best taught after a certain one. Like I'm not gonna go from learning about, uh, from teaching about the learning process to all of a sudden teaching you about treating psychological disorders. Would that make any sense? No, they don't go together. So what should I teach you after learning? Cognition. Memory or other cognition, right? That makes sense because we're talking about related things. So we talked about the learning process. Now we're talking about how you store that information and, and retrieve it, which is memory, right? Uh, it wouldn't make sense to go from teaching about learning and then jumping into treating psychological disorders, it just doesn't make any sense. When should I teach you about treating psychological disorders? 
after you learn about psychological disorders? When should I teach you about psychological disorders? That's a harder one. After. After. I'll make it easy for you. It's much easier for you to understand and remember psychological disorders, which are some form of uh, malfunctioning in the brain, if you understand the basics. the basics of how your brain and behavior work. Right, so that's what I try to go in there. <coughs> so we start with, here's environmental genetic factors. Here are the specifics about how your uh, cognition, learning, and memory work. Oh, here's the specifics about how your motivations and emotions work. Now you know how the brain works. Now you know the impact, the, the, the factors of the environment and the um, in your genes, you know how the brain thinks, uh, learns things, remembers them, how uh, uh, emotions and motivations can affect your perception, you know how to sense things. Now we can talk about how things go wrong. I can't start with how things go wrong if you don't even know how the damn thing works. Like I'm not gonna be like, all right, cool, so I'm gonna teach you guys how to fix a transmission in a car if you don't understand how a transmission works in a car or how the car works itself. You have to know the role of the transmission and the parts of the car to understand the specifics about repairing a, a transmission uh, issue, essentially. All right, so that's what we do. Uh, and that's why we put it in that order. Make sense? So what is that example of me? Uh, what would be me giving you five minute terms to learn at the beginning of the year as opposed to me ordering it so you learn about how uh, the brain is impacted, how the brain works, how thinking and emotions work, and then how psychological disorders work, and then how the treatment for those psychological disorders work. Which one's the sheet of terms, and which one's the ordering it uh, logically? Uh, the shallow processing was like just a sheet, like given your reading, and the deep processing, you order it, or you put some type of storyline. Yeah, exactly, because that gives it meaning to you uh, and helps you build on your understanding. All right, cool. And again, uh, I mean, an easier example was the number thing. Random set of numbers, as opposed to a number that is close to or exactly your birthday, it's gonna, you're gonna remember it much more easily because it is, uh, has meaning to you. Or even like, uh, like as you, most of you probably know your parents' birthdays, if it's a number that's close to your parents' birthday, you're more likely to remember it than a random number as well. All right, uh, and that's the difference. So this stuff has very, very little uh, long-term capacity. The odds that I'm gonna remember something that's based on just shallow processing, like learn these random numbers in, an, in order, very, very low compared to the, uh, um, the odds I will remember the information if it has meaning to me or significance or context. I think I told you yesterday, right, how those world record holders for memorizing sequences of random numbers do it. They don't memorize the sequence of numbers. What do they do? Yeah, they, they, they give a specific meaning to each number or letter, and then as they see the sequence, they tell the story in their head, and then when they... Uh, recall the story, they can recall the numbers because like, let's say like one means food, you know, and then two means dad, and three means mom, and then they, they get a sequence of numbers and then they have this weird story in their head and they can remember the weird story and, and they can provide the numbers. So they're not even remembering the numbers, they're remembering the story. You guys got that? All right, um, what's next? Did I do all of these for? I think that's it for the memory. That's all for 15, right? Now it's on to 16. Yep, we covered it all. Cool. All right. No, page 16. We're still on memory, though. So we'll learn a little bit more about short-term and long-term, and then we'll get to uh, uh, forgetting and well, how to improve your memory and how to how you forget stuff sometimes. Yeah. Imagine. You're good. Okay. So more specifics on memory. So we'll start with what I, something I've already kind of introduced you to, too, which is short-term memory. So this is that stuff you hold for a short amount of time, obviously, hence the name, uh, and the odds that you'll remember it are relatively low because everything I take in, for the most part, is short-term memory. Ladies, quiet, please, thank you. Uh, everything that you're, all the information you're taking in is technically short-term memory uh, to some extent. And every second that goes by, what happens to that uh, um, short-term uh, memory? It slowly, yeah, gets fuzzier, dissipates, you lose detail. Okay, so short-term memory. All right, a lot of that is linked to, like uh, we already mentioned, the um, hippocampus, not exclusively, but it's very much linked to it. And uh, that's temporarily held. So that's the sensory info or new info that comes in, and I hold it for a few seconds or minutes, and then it kind of goes away, unless I put it into long-term memory. All right, so short-term memory. So here's a couple examples. So I gave you one yesterday. What's an example of something that's very similar to, but not exactly the same thing as short-term memory? This is kind of more like 
how well your short-term memory works. <coughs> Working memory, right. So um, I, don't, I don't think this works exactly as a definition, but working memory is your ability to uh, keep this short-term memory that you're getting like in a little bubble so you can use it uh, to remember things about that topic or person. So if you go in a big <coughs> monologue about something, or like if you're listening to me talk, because I talk here for a long time, uh, your ability to remember the little things that I would say and then I ask a question, uh, that's, that could be a representation of your working memory. Uh, a good way to test it is what? I think I told you yesterday. What's a good way to test my working memory? Who gave me the working memory answer, by the way? You did? Okay. How can I test my working memory? See if it's any good or not. Exactly. You can choose the digits too. Be like six, seven, eight, nine, ten digits, whatever. And it'll be like, boop, it'll pop it up and it'll go away. And you have to correctly enter it. Uh, and that's a good way to find out kind of how good your um, working memory is. What is it positively correlated with? Like the correlation coefficients, uh, it's pretty high. It's like a 0.8 or something like that. Related your IQ? Yep. It's uh, related to your IQ. And they think that's because if I'm figuring something out, I have to be able to hold information in my brain to use it to think about a problem or remember something. Uh, if I can't do that, then it's really hard to figure out something complex because I keep forgetting the parts, the components of the complex idea. All right, so we already got that. Um, but more specific types, this is more about an ability, a measurement of your ability. Specific types are um, uh, episodic, no, iconic is what I call it, but it's pretty much the same thing. Iconic, that's how I spell it. There's echoic, and there's sensory or sensation. I can't remember how exactly it's spelled. Sensory. sensory. Cool. <coughs> sensory. Uh, these are all examples of short-term memory. So, if I were to show you a picture, let's say it's just like a couple people at a park, and there's like a pond, and then there's some people playing in the background, and like there's some clouds and whatnot. I show you the picture, and you look at it. And I take it away and I say, recreate it. What are you going to be depending on? Yeah, your memory of that image, right? That's the uh, iconic memory. So it's kind of your ability to almost take like a mental picture. But what happens as I start drawing that picture out? What happens to the detail in that memory I have? It slowly, yeah, it goes away, gets <coughs> distorted, gets fuzzy, exactly. So uh, in the first few seconds, this is a an increasingly, a decreasingly detailed visual representation over time. So the first few seconds, this again means the first few seconds, I got a really good vivid picture. I know the colors, what's going on, how many people are in it, but as the seconds go by and I start recreating this, those details begin to fade uh, and then it starts becoming distorted. Perhaps I unintentionally make up some details that I thought were there but aren't actually there or I just outright forget. They have tests of this too. My family always plays like uh, games at holidays and one of them I remember was like it was like a it was a Christmas game. They didn't tell you what they just walked out with a platter there was a whole bunch of random Christmas stuff on it and they're like alright look at the platter look at the platter look at the platter and they walk out and they say tell me all the things that are on the platter and you like write down like there were three candy canes there were you know that sort of stuff. And so first you go, all right, and you get like 10 things. You're like, oh, but then what else was that? There was something there. And like, you kind of forget the details and it gets less accurate. All right. So then what would echoic memory be? If this is a, like a momentary mental image that slowly gets worse over time? Echoic memory is like you hear it and it's there for like a second. Like someone tells you the name, but then you forget it afterwards. Exactly. It's usually more than a second. But yeah, for a few seconds, it's almost like there's an echo of sound in your brain. There isn't. But... For a moment, you have that short-term memory of what you heard. And again, they call it echoic because it's almost like you're listening to an echo. So let's say I'm not paying attention at all, which I'm, you got, you got, that happens in this class and other classes where you're not paying attention uh, and maybe you get called on or, or the teacher or your mom or your dad or whoever, they're like, what did I just say? Because they say you weren't paying attention. Can you repeat what they said usually? No. You can't? I can't. You can sometimes. Fair enough. Sometimes you cannot. But sometimes, can you remember what they said even though you weren't paying attention? Yes. 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 Why? Because of your echoic memory, right? That short-term memory that took in the sound info even though you weren't paying attention to it. And you can kind of like think, 
Oh, she just said that she, this happened to me like two days ago. I was like looking at something, <coughs> and my wife was like, blah, 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 I don't remember what she was saying, but I remember this part. She at one point was like, said something about me not paying attention. And I was like, I was like, no, I was paying attention. And then she, I was like, you just said this. And that was all I knew. But it was enough for her to be like, okay, I guess you're listening. I was like, whew, thanks, I enjoyed that. <laughs> um, and she's gonna watch this video and bring it up, but whatever. Um, yeah, it was something about, she was talking about something uh, my son did, and, uh, and I heard the last part of it, obviously, because of my echoic memory. I was like, oh, you said you did this thing, and there was a problem. And I was like, got it. Um, but yeah, so it doesn't mean I was actually listening. I'm just gonna remember the last few sounds that came into uh, uh, my memory. And obviously, the longer I wait, the quicker those, those dissipate. All right, so it's almost like an echo effect but not actually, because not actually sound waves bouncing around your head. But it's almost like an echo effect uh, regarding short term uh, auditory info. And that's why when someone's like, you weren't even listening to me, you can usually repeat the last couple things they said. Uh, but beyond that, it gets really difficult because the short term memory is dissipated. Uh, and if it wasn't put into long term memory, then you're not going to recall it. Okay, and then sensory. Uh, this one's harder, but possible. If I just feel something or taste something or smell something, I can really recall exactly what it felt, tasted, or smelled like. All right, but uh, if you ask me a few minutes later, it's gonna be hard for me to recall exactly what it tasted like. So you all know what an orange tastes like, right? It's hard to describe how an orange tastes, but uh, you just kind of have a vague idea of it. But if I just gave you a slice of orange and you took a bite of it, you'd have a really, really good, vivid memory of what it tastes like or smells. Like we kind of know what a rose smells like. We'd recognize it, but I'm much more likely to remember exactly what it smells like if I've just smelled a rose. And that's, that's the same idea. So it's really the same thing as these two, except it's the other <coughs> senses. It's related to uh, touch, taste, and smell. Uh, and that's the uh, sensory short term. So we got the short term thing down. Okay, what would make something long-term then? So this by definition is something that uh, is only temporarily available and diminishes quickly. What would long-term be then? Don't just say memories that last. More permanent? Yeah, more permanent. Is there a limit to how much long-term memory I can use? Not that we know of. Uh, you have way more neurons uh, than you are probably capable of filling with information. It's almost like your brain is a phone that has like 50 terabytes of info cap. And like you could, you could never fill it, that up. Even if you're just taking pictures constantly, it would take you absolutely forever uh, to fill it up. And the fact that you forget things means it's almost like you're deleting videos and pictures as you go. So the chances of you <coughs> filling that whole thing up are, are almost zero. Um, and they might be infinite because we don't know if it's specific neurons hold the memory or specific sequences of neurons hold the memory because if it's sequences There's just unlimited combinations of sequences. So uh, it's relatively in your human lifetime Impossible to fill up your long-term and be like I can't remember any new information because it's full like your phone's full uh, on, on data All right, so long term How did you phrase it by the way? Yeah, uh, relatively permanent, or at least uh, uh, robust, it lasts a long time. Uh, limitless memories. All right, and, that, and that's, that's easy. You've got plenty of examples of long term, right? You all know various capitals and countries and governments <coughs> and facts from history and facts about your life and other people's lives. Those are long term. Those are ones that happened a long time ago, but I can still remember it. All right, and we have those. Um, there is something though that makes it easier to remember things long term. But before I get to that, um, the phenomena that I put in there about procedural learning, or sorry, procedural long term memory and um, a flashbulb, they're similar to uh, what we learned about uh, explicit and uh, um, uh, implicit memories. So the explicit, obviously, are the facts. Facts and the implicit are the uh, this is conscious recollection, and then of course there's the uh, uh, we'll say declarative because I have to like explain them consciously. 
declarative. Um, what's an example of implicit long-term memory? Something that I won't forget, even though I couldn't tell you exactly what it was. Like learning how to walk. Yep, learning how to walk, exactly. I could damage my neural system in some way that I do lose it, but assuming I don't damage it, even if I don't do it and I don't think about it for a long time, I won't lose that ability. So like, uh, uh, isn't another example? What, what is another example? Walking is a great example. What's another skill-based procedural type thing? Riding a bike. Riding a bike. Uh, they're not wrong, because I went years without riding a bike uh, at one point in my life, and then I hop on a bike and it's like I never missed a day of it, because uh, it's just stored in the long-term uh, procedurally. So this is kind of like that skill or association-based memory. You could call it procedural. In fact, I think I do in the notes. Uh, that's procedural memory. If I have to remember a specific event, though, like I remember when I graduated high school or eighth grade or whatever it is that you're going to graduate eventually or college, um, you'll probably remember details about the day, like who was there, was it sunny or not, was it cold or not, uh, what some people said, what the speech was about, what you did after. You remember things like that. Uh, is that implicit memory or is it explicit? Why is it explicit? You're right. Why is it explicit? Because you're consciously... Thinking. Yeah, you have to consciously think about the event and then pull out details. All right? So uh, the flashbulb memory that we talk about where you have like these really specific images of like what the day was like or what the expression on your dad's face was like or your brother or your sister when this thing happened, that's a flashbulb memory. It's almost like you took a picture and you remember a lot of details about it. But it's not automatic. Do I have to like consciously think about it and describe it? I do, right? So that would make it explicit. So that's where flashbulb memory would come into a play here. Uh, flashbulb. Flashbulb moment or flashbulb memory. And that'll happen too, by the way. Uh, and it's usually things that are very emotionally um, stimulating. So the, the, the memories that these are tied to are like, uh, you guys aren't alive yet, but almost everyone that was consciously aware of their existence at the time, meaning they were like, you know, older than like six or seven, maybe even ten, uh, everyone remembers exactly what the day was like and where they found out about the uh, uh, September 11th uh, World Trade Center attack. <coughs> like, I remember extremely vividly waking up in the morning, walking over, and my parents are just like zombies standing in front of the TV with this just look I've never seen their faces before of like this disbelief. And then there's like this building on fire. And so I didn't know at first. I was like, oh, there's a fire. And my dad's like, no, they, uh, a plane ran into it. So I was like, oh, it was an accident, I guess. That's what we thought. Because when my parents were watching it, it was the first plane. So it just seemed like a bad accident. In my head, I was like, oh, it makes sense. They're flying over the city. Some plane screws up. They're going to hit a skyscraper. All right. Uh, but then we watched the second plane live go in and hit. And the reporters were like in shock. And you have that moment. Ooh, I just got chills. You have that moment where you realize, like, oh, this is intentional. Someone's flying planes into this building. Um, everyone I've ever talked to that went through that. Yeah, my hairs are standing on end. Um, everyone that I have talked to that went through that, they remember a lot of detail about that day. Like, I remember where I was, what my parents' room looked like at the time, because their TV was in, the, in their bedroom at the time in this, like, weird wooden open-up uh, uh, dresser thing which has been gone for years, but I remember it because it's part of that exact flashbulb memory of where it was and what they were doing and what school was like that day because I was in seventh grade and, um, no, sorry, I was in eighth grade that day or that year and uh, I remember what my teacher was like and how we just watched the news all day and we were all trying to figure it out and like, yeah, it was pretty crazy. So that one sticks out really, really clearly. Like, I remember very specific memories about it. Uh, other ones, I remember my graduation very specifically. I remember uh, other, like, first times, like, you know, uh, lifetime first. Like, you have a really good thing with an athletic uh, award or game. Uh, you graduate high school or college. Uh, uh, you get married. Your kid's born. I remember, I mean, that was pretty recent. That was only, like, nine months ago for, uh, for my recent one, but... I remember everything about it, very, 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 very detailed and specific. Um, like I could recreate the whole thing, like where all the rooms were, uh, where he was in the, uh, in, in the rooms, and like what was attached to him, what wasn't attached to him, how I got called in, like all the details, got it all, uh, because it was an emotionally stimulating event. So you'll find that's the case for most of your memories. If I say, remember something from second grade, in fact, do that right now. Try to remember a specific memory from second grade or first grade. First or second grade? You guys have one? Yeah. <laughs> Is anybody willing to share their memory? Um, I grew up in Augusta, but 
like every year we would have a jog a thon. And oh, I yeah. just remember that memory specifically because after we would like have our jog a thon, we would get a popsicle. Okay. So we would look forward to having that popsicle. Okay. And just would have you being happy about that. Okay, good. That made you happy. So it's a fun memory. Yeah. So you got the runner's high, and then you also got extra happy, an extra dopamine hit. So you had endorphins going, you got an extra dopamine hit because you would get the popsicle. Cool. All right, what else? Any other examples? Oh, come on, that was it. I got attention in second grade after doing a test. That was your first attention, probably, yeah. right? Okay, your first attention. All right, the jogathons. Wait, well, but the jogathon thing, is that a, I'm talking about a specific memory, not just like we did jogathons. Like, I remember this jogathon because yeah, it was like specifically second grade. I oh. mean, it happened every year, but that was the one year that I remember. Oh, that you got the reward like that? Yeah. Okay. All right. So that makes it new. All right. Sp fair enough. All right. So we've got first popsicle reward for a jogathon. So you got a lot of endorphins going in the dopamine for the popsicle. Um, extremely embarrassing, humiliating, upsetting uh, <laughs> situation where you get your first attention. <coughs> what uh, What else we got from second or first grade? Day. Okay. And you know how they turn out the IDs? I just specifically remember what I was wearing. So. Okay. Why do you? Um, <laughs> Did you think you looked really good that day, or not good that day, or what? Yeah, I like I liked what the outfit I was wearing. So. Okay. So it was a momentous picture, and you were very pleased with the way you looked in this picture because of what you're wearing. Okay, fair enough. In first grade, I remember this one kid had like really sharp teeth. Okay. Oh, you got it. All right. All right. So that's kind of like the detention thing. It's your first time getting in trouble like that. And so was it an emotionally taxing experience? Probably. Yeah, I would assume so. Right. Another example? Let's do one more. What you got? Um, I was going to say, like, um, uh, as a kid in second grade, like, I would have, like, this blanket, and, like, I had this bed. I put the bed underneath so that the blanket would blow up, and I thought, that was pretty good as a kid. Like, I thought that was a cool, like, no other kids did that. Oh, cool. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. That's good. That reminds me of, oh, never mind. So, uh, <laughs> good ideas that you think are good as a kid but aren't a good idea at all. Like, I'll just tell you anyway. So we did this experiment, I think it was in second grade, where we, uh, no, it was fourth grade, um, where we had to make this ice cube last as long as possible, like, not melt. And so none of us knew what the hell to do. Uh, so like one group just did nothing, just put it on their desk. One one girl was clever and put it in her little uh, little igloo uh, uh, lunchbox. Um, other kids did other things. And my partner had the brilliant idea of water's cold, let's run it under water, which was <laughs> which was the worst thing we could have done. So we actually melted it faster than anybody else. But like you think you're like, oh, if water's cold, this will keep it cold. But you don't understand like freezing and the fact that. You know, it is water that's frozen, so if you run water on it, it's just going to make it warmer and melt it. So, but anyways, yeah, so we were, remember that one specifically because we were like, I don't want to say it was embarrassed, but we were very disappointed though. So that one, that one sticks out. Uh, what, a common thing in most of these is uh, these are emotionally arousing experiences. Whether you're very happy about something or very upset or ashamed about something or embarrassed or confused, these are moments where uh, you recall... Uh, exactly a moment because it was meaningful to you at that time. Do you remember what your report card was in second grade? Oh, you might. You might if you were like really happy that you all got like straight A's or something like that. Uh, but you probably don't remember every report card you've ever had through your entire life. Probably. The ones you might remember are the ones where, oh, you screwed up bad and got in trouble. Or, oh, for the first time you got straight A's or something like that. You'll remember those ones. But that's what I'm trying to get across to you guys. And, um, there's an actual phenomena that they refer to this that helps you remember those moments, that makes them so specific and detailed and long lasting. Uh, and that's uh, long term potentiation. So, again, the likelihood that these old memories <coughs> you have were emotionally stimulating is uh, very high. So, this one basically, this idea means. You're more likely to remember something over the long term if it was uh, neurologically stimulating. So what I mean by that is, were you really anxious? That would heighten your cortisol, that would heighten your norepinephrine, uh, it would make your body more alert, so you'd have a flood of neural activity because you're scared 
or upset about something. So that's like you guys getting in trouble for the first time. You're either embarrassed or upset or mad or, or whatever, probably not mad, but or scared of punishment, whatever it might be. Uh, so it's, you're gonna have a lot of neural activity because you're afraid, you're anxious. Uh, the running example, uh, you're more likely to remember that one because if you're doing a lot of running and then you get rewarded right after, you've got endorphins flowing, so like the runner's high from all the jogathon uh, uh, running, and then you also get the added excitement of the reward afterwards, so you get another hit <coughs> of dopamine on top of that. Um, anytime you have a lot of neural stimulation, again, meaning your brain's highly active because you just had an emotional surge, so your brain releases a bunch of chemicals, whether it's fear and anxiety, or it's happiness, or, 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 or you know, endorphins or whatever, the more <coughs> active your neural circuitry is with these neuro, uh, uh, neurotransmitters, the more likely you are to remember something. So uh, increasing in neural activity, so example, a uh, highly emotional event uh, increases the potency, I don't say potency, the likelihood the memory will be stored in long term with great detail. Before I talk about how they tested this, by the way, to confirm that this is true, why would I be able to better remember, think about it like an evolutionary psychology explanation for this. Why would I be able to recall specifically events that may be very happy or excited or very sad or fearful or angry? So if you have like successful moments or something went right, mm -hmm. um, you could, you'd be able to remember it and re, like, re-perform that act or whatever you did that made you feel good. Exactly. Like a, the opposite where it's like you feel like super anxious or scared or something went wrong. Or sad, yeah. Exactly. Okay, so this is a great mechanism that we've got evolutionary installed in us, evolutionarily installed in us, where something that's really good and, and positive for us, we remember uh, because it's good and positive for us. That's going to increase the odds of us being happy and thriving and living and passing our genes and all that stuff. On the flip side, just as important, if not more important actually, is we remember the really, really bad things. So things that made us very sad or upset or fearful uh, because those things are dangerous to us. Uh, they could harm us, so we want to avoid them, right? So th that's why, obviously, your life's not threatened by attention, uh, and your life's not improved by getting a pop school after the uh, uh, jogathon. But the the, uh, the the mechanisms are the same. Anytime I get a flood of neural activity, whatever emotion it might be, I'm more likely to remember that because the ancestors we've had that remember those <coughs> moments that are very terrifying or dangerous or very happy and rewarding. They're the ones that lived because they avoided the terrifying, dangerous stuff because they remembered to avoid it, and they remembered the uh, stuff that helped them uh, uh, live because they remembered the good stuff, like this worked out really well, I should do it. Uh, that's, that's sort of how this works. So that's a good evolutionary explanation for this. The reason why I remember these highly neurally active emotional moments is that's helped our ancestors survive. Bad ones, avoid. Good ones, promote, keep doing, all right? Um, so, how could I test this, by the way? I mean, we just kind of did here uh, uh, by just a survey, but screw the survey. How could I test this in real time? How could I, like, give you guys a test and see if this works out or not? Obviously, the survey thing worked, sort of, but what else? What other way could I do this? Let me ask you this. You guys understand this is part of the... Uh, deep processing. Did we already learn how drugs and neurochemistry works? Mm -hmm. Right? We know that like stimulants do what? Speed up your and increase your neural activity. What slows them down? <coughs> Depressants. Depressants. Okay. So, could I make an experiment out of this using narcotics? Wait, so would you block the LTP, um, like the LTP process? How would I do that though? That's what I'm asking. Uh, just a, give me a, a type of drug. You know, like cocaine. Not, but. <laughs> okay, well, what could I do? How could I see if it confirms or, or, or denies this, uh, this finding, or refutes, I mean?
Okay, but that's an individual person. I don't know if that would do anything. But you're on, you're on the right track. Let me ask you this. If this is true, then if I give you a <laughs> stimulant, let's assume it's legal and doesn't harm you, and I give you a stimulant, would the stimulant make your memory better or worse? Ooh, I heard both. What does a stimulant do? So hold on, let's listen to this. More neural activity I have, the more likely I am to remember something. If I give you a stimulant, what's that gonna do to your memory if this is true? It would make it better, why? You have more neural activity, okay, cool, fair enough. Um, I could confirm it by potentially giving, uh, conducting an experiment where half the people that are randomly selected, randomly assigned from a large population, right? Because we, we need to have those to control for confounding variables. I've got my population, but it's nothing. That's randomly selected, randomly assigned with a large population. Then I have my randomly assigned, randomly selected large population control group, sorry, experimental group that uh, gets the stimulant. So control group, no stimulant. Experimental group, stimulant. Which one should do better on the exact same memory test? Like I say, here's 30 things, and then I give you a test on it. Who should do better if this is true? Yeah, the stimulant group, the one that got the, ex uh, the experimental group in this case. They should perform better. Uh, and I should be able to replicate that. I should be able to take another group of people, do the same thing, another group of people do the same thing, and I should consistently get the experimental group, despite the test being the same, doing better. Does that make sense? They did that. Confirm. How could I test it the other way, too? How could I make, because theoretically, I could make your memory worse than by reducing your neural activity. How could I do that? Exactly, so how could I set that experiment up? Yep, the exact same thing I described, except the experimental group gets depressants instead of stimulants. Okay, so let's take that same example, but we'll, we'll swap it. Experimental group gets depressants, the control group has nothing. Who's gonna do better on the test? The control group, the control group right? So the depressant group should do worse because they have less neural activity, which means their memory is worse. Uh, that's actually true, by the way, uh, and is uh, able to be replicated. That, uh, I don't know about every specific stimulant, but they can, uh, uh, via um, medications, increase your neural activity, and that does make your memory a little bit better. And if they, uh, on the reverse side, uh, give, reduce your neural activity, it actually makes your memory a little bit worse. So that's uh, good evidence to um, support this, this theory, this idea about long-term potentiation. A lot of people get confused on this, but just think of it like this. All this says is, I remember stuff better, if my neural activity is up. So give me some examples of things that would increase my neural activity and make me more likely to remember <coughs> things. Non-drug related, by the way, just in life. Um, <coughs> what? Caffeine. Uh, I said non-drug related, yeah. but you're right, that's a drug example that would work, potentially. Uh, an yep, an emotional event. What kind, though, if I'm gonna remember it? Give me an example. Um, okay. That's a highly, uh, potentially a highly uh, emotional event. Uh, probably the happiness, I would assume, depending on the person. But yes, uh, that's going to be an event uh, that would be an example. That, what's another example that could happen? The death of the relative. Yes, that's another big one too. That's gonna make you incredibly sad. So you're very, like I remember when my uh, uh, great grandma, who I actually wasn't even that close to uh, when I was 12, but I, I remember exactly where I was told when she died, how old I was, and, and all of those details, uh, because it sticks out. Uh, as an emotionally uh, arousing event, right, which confirms this theory. So again, anything that's very emotional, whether it's happy, sad, whatever, uh, you're going to remember that moment with much more detail uh, because of this increased neural activity. And again, that's part of the reason why um, people try to enhance their studying ability uh, or memorization for whatever reason uh, by uh, using drugs that can act as neural enhancers. Um, so watch out for that. And uh, I would strongly recommend not doing it uh, because people don't know what drugs mix with what. So sometimes you're like, oh, this thing is a stimulant, but you don't know it interacts with this other medication you're taking, and then you have a heart attack or you have liver failure or something like that. So don't kill yourself trying to do better on a test is what I'm saying. Anyways, that's how it works. Any questions about long-term potentiation? More emotion and activity means better memory. Take a break. Now we'll talk about uh, two sets of, two ways you can or tricks or ways or phenomena that help you remember things besides long-term potentiation. So we, need, we know long-term long -term potentiation if you're more neurally active. Did I hit start?
Okay. Well, if you're more neurally active, um, you're more likely to remember the, the memory. And again, that helps our survival. Things that are really, really bad that make us experience negative emotions, we want to know those to avoid them. Things that are really good, we get positive emotions, a lot of them. Remember them because we want to remember them because they help us out. So, um, <clears throat> here are some ways that aid your memory even without you uh, intentionally using them. So these are factors that cause us to remember things better. Uh, not that we do them on purpose. We'll talk about some you can use on purpose to help you out. Uh, but these are ones that inadvertently help us remember things. So the first one is uh, uh, a retrieval cue. So this is one of those times when you can't remember something, whatever it might be, but then you remember something else that's related to it, and all of a sudden it like unlocks that specific memory you have. Um, so like example, I, I was talking with something about my wife the other day. She was, she was saying, remember I told you this one thing? Uh, and I was like, no, I don't remember you telling me that. And then she remembered, she mentioned something that happened like right after it or right before it. And then I was e immediately, able to, immediately able to remember all of the rest of it. I did that like one little detail was like a key to unlock the rest of it. Uh, that's what a retrieval cue is. So anytime that you're stuck on something, you can't remember it, but you remember something that's closely related or a part of it, and that immediately allows you to remember all of the rest of it. Not quite an epiphany. An epiphany is an idea. We'll talk about that. That's an insight, creativity, uh, problem solving. This is, uh, it's just a mechanism that allows you to unlock that memory. All right. Um, what's an example I could give? What you got? Wait, is it kind of like deja vu? No, that's a, that's a retrieval error we'll talk about here in a moment. This is where, here, here's an example. I don't know how much this helps you. Sometimes I get former students, and they're like, hey, Mr. Morgan, and like, I can't remember their name. I know their face, because I, I have hundreds of students. Uh, so over time, like, I forget the individual's names. I remember you as a person, be like, oh, yeah. Uh, but I, it's oftentimes, especially if I haven't had <coughs> you for a couple years, it's easy to forget your name. Um, but what I can usually do and use as a retrieval cue is I'm able to remember where you sat for whatever reason because uh, my spatial memory, I don't know, is better than my verbal memory or something like that. So usually what happens uh, that I'm able to remember their names is they say, oh, hey, or whatever. And I'm like, oh, hey, how's it been? And in the background, I'm like, your name is, your name is, or and I'm like, trying to remember what it is. And I'll recall, be like, okay, this person, I remember I had them, and they sat over on the left. And it was an economics class. And so then there's these people in their class. So it's that class group, and then I'll, I'll remember their name uh, when I can remember that information. <coughs> So, was I able to just recall their name out of memory? No, but I was able to unlock the memory by remembering other things associated with it. So it's kind of like uh, a trick that can sort of unlock other memories. Um, I could probably ask you about a movie. You've probably all seen Beauty and the Beast, right? Mm -hmm. At some point in your lives? Are you gonna remember the exact storyline for the entire movie, every detail about it? No. no. But what I would bet is the more you, like if I said write the whole sequence of events for Beauty and the Beast, all right, it'd be hard. But if I gave you hints, or even if you, as you're writing it out, you write something down specific about like, oh, she was attacked by wolves. Why was she attacked by wolves? Uh, then you might remember, oh yeah, she got thrown off of her horse. Oh yeah, because she was running away from the beast. Well, it, it would help, help you to remember other parts of that story. Those are retrieval cues. So if I did give you an assignment, I'm not going to do that, but if I gave you an assignment, uh, write all the events in the uh, Beauty and the Beast series, uh, you would only have a few to start out with, but as you started writing them, what's going to happen? You're going to remember other parts. That's a retrieval cue because it's linked to another memory. So you're like, okay, she got thrown off of wolves. I don't remember why. Oh, yeah, she got thrown off her horse. Why was she on a horse? Oh, she's running away from the castle. Why? Oh, because the beast told her to leave because he was angry. Why was she angry to her? Oh, because she looked in the West Wing or touched the rose or something like that. Oh, it, so it, like, it, it like helps you unlock all those other memories about it. I hope I'm right about that being the beast part. Isn't that why, G? Yeah. Okay, yeah, good. It's been a while, but yeah. <clears throat> so that, that's, a, that's an example of it. So uh, um, associated memories that uh, enable recall of others. 
right? Uh, this happens, by the way, if you write essays in any class. So like I, I give you a question for uh, history or, or even psychology, an FRQ. It's like, oh, here's a situation, here's a bunch of terms. And you're like, oh, crap. I only remember three of those. And you start writing about the three you remember. But uh, as you're writing, since the other topics are generally similar or associated, sometimes, I'm sure you've experienced this, you're writing about one and it reminds you of an answer to the, to the other one. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, that's how writing and putting things into word can actually help you out because it helps you to remember the associations that you already have. All right, that's probably the most complex one. This one's much easier. It's called mood congruency. Congruency means like aligned with or similar to. So, when I'm angry, I am much more likely to remember other times that I was angry. When I'm sad, I am much more likely to remember other times that I was sad. When I'm happy, I'm much more likely to remember other times that I was happy. Why do you think that is? Because of congruency. Yeah, because of mood congruency. Uh, the reason is, by the way, this might be <coughs> technical, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, the reason why is when you're experiencing certain emotions, uh, it alters your perception. We know this, right? Um, so the way you perceive things, you're going to use a similar set of neural paths. So when you are angry uh, and you're accessing memory, it's going to use those same neural paths uh, that you used when your perception is happy or sad or mad or whatever. <coughs> uh, and that's going to uh, coincide with a lot of other memories that are on that same uh, neural pathway because your perception is, I'm angry or I'm happy or I'm sad or whatever it might be. And so you're going to use a similar network and that's going to be uh, related to or associated with a lot of other examples when you're in that mood. Here's what I'm talking about. Um, whether you have a boyfriend or girlfriend or whether you're talking about your parents, when you're really mad at somebody, or let me, let me rephrase this actually. No, yeah, when you're mad at them, they do something to you. Like they, they, uh, they uh, let's do brother or sister. Let's say your uh, brother does something to make you mad, like your little kid. He takes something from you. And so you're like, ah, and you try to hit him back and, and your parents are like, whoa, what, what happened here? You're going to remember all of the things your brother did to you recently. You're like, well, he took the thing, and then yesterday he did this thing, and he pulled this away, and then the other day he ruined this thing. Why am I remembering all those things that he did that were uh, bad to me that made me angry? Because you were mad each time. Yeah, each time I was mad, right? So it, it allowed, that's what mood congruency is. You're much more easily able to recall all things that were related to it. So when you're remembering something about something that made you mad at somebody, you're also going to remember all those other times they made you angry. All right, this is going to happen, I guarantee it, with your significant others, wives or husbands or boyfriends or girlfriends in the future. They're gonna get mad at you for something, and then you're gonna have this list of things you did to them. Uh, and it's not that they're just sitting there all day with this list in their head and like, by the way, uh, but when you get them angry for, for whatever reason, even if it's not your fault, they automatically start remembering all the other reasons why that they're angry at you or were angry at you five months ago. Uh, so they're gonna be like, well, yeah, we did this thing, and then you did this thing too, and this made me mad. You always do this because you do this thing. Like they're gonna remember all these little things, these details about why they're mad at you and why you need to fix whatever issue it might be. All right. Uh, and so the same is gonna happen to you, by the way. You're gonna be mad at them for something, and you're gonna instantly recall all the other things that you're mad at them for, even though 10 seconds ago when you weren't mad, you weren't thinking about them, and maybe you didn't even remember them. All right. That's mood congruency. Um, it is kind of linked because they, they are associated memories, but this has more to do with that mood because you're in that perception mode and you're going to uh, re, uh, uh, revisit a lot of that, that same, those same neural networks and pathways that you stored, the other memories that made you angry at this person or, or happy in this case, whatever it might be. Does that make sense? The easiest one to remember is the angry example because I guarantee you if you get mad at your parents or significant other or brother or whatever, you're immediately going to remember all the other reasons why you don't like them. Uh, or why they made you mad for whatever reason. All right, that makes sense? Mm -hmm. All right, um, another one. I forget what the other two are that I wanna talk about. What are they on the notes? I forget the terms that they are. Serial position. Oh yeah, yeah. serial position effects. Stereotype. Oh yeah, the stereotype one. I don't like <coughs> this one. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. This one, it feels like they inserted synthetically, like it's <coughs> politically motivated. Maybe it's not but uh, um, I'll, I'll explain it. So again, mood congruency, likely 
to remember other memories while in the same or similar mood. Uh, serial position effect. This one's kind of a cool one. If uh, we go this whole period, right? I told you a bunch of stuff. And let's say the next day I gave you a pop quiz. Uh, there are things that you're going to remember because uh, there was deep processing, deep processing that occurred. Maybe some, an example I gave, you remember because it tied into you or an experience you had or whatever. But let's assume that that didn't happen. Let's say that uh, all the examples I gave were brand new to you and there weren't any associations. You are more likely to remember the first things I said or the last things I said than the stuff in the middle. That's what's called the serial position effect. Like if I give you a list of 20 things, here you go. And then like 10 seconds later, it's like, all right, write that list out. You're much more likely to accurately, accurately remember the starting ones in the list and the ending ones on the list as opposed to the ones in the middle. That's all it means. So when, they, when you get a bunch of information coming in, you are, and they've tested this multiple times, it is confirmed more likely to remember um, beginning and ending uh, sequences of info. So likely the reason for this is, by the way, when you start something, am I gonna be paying more attention or less attention than when I'm 10 minutes into it? More attention, right? You're like, oh, here's this new thing. And you're focused, and then it goes on, and you kind of lose focus. All right, happens to everybody. Happens to some of you right now. Um, why am I, okay, that, make, that makes sense why I'm more able to remember the beginning, but why am I more able to remember the end? Because maybe I'm not paying as much attention as I am at the beginning. This one's the easiest answer. Because you're anticipating What? Because you're anticipating the end. No, let's pretend you don't know when the end is going to be. It's super simple. It's just more recent. What's the last thing? Yeah, it's just the most recent thing. That's, that's all it is. Uh, in fact, that's, it's not exactly related to this Ebbinghaus curve, which is on your notes somewhere. Um, uh, the idea that you lose information uh, at a generally a pretty steady rate if you don't incorporate it into long-term memory. So let's assume I give you a bunch of facts. Uh, if I asked you right afterwards, you would be very, very accurate. This is 100%. So let's say it was 30 seconds, uh, 20 minutes, one day, three days, and then a month. I don't know where I wrote here, one month. And these are the percentages of accuracy I have answering the question. So like, here's 20 terms, and I give them to you. This is 50%, this is 75%, this is 25%. What happens very quickly is the first 30 seconds or a few seconds, you'll get at or near 100%, like pretty high, but not even a half an hour later, all of a sudden I go from remembering almost all of it to remembering only about half of it or so. Really quickly. Uh, so that's part of the reason why I have the serial position effect. It's just the most recent information stays with you better than information before it. Uh, then it keeps going. Uh, if I go an hour, it drops like another 20%. And then for whatever reason, most information stabilizes at about around 20-ish percent. So that's what normal memory looks like if you're not intentionally, explicitly, effortfully trying to process it. All right, so that's kind of what happens. Um, you can stave this off by using some of the effects we'll talk about here in a second, but this other one, the stereotype effect, you have to know it, but it's just such a weird one, I don't understand why that they put this in. This is the idea that you're uh, less likely to remember something if you fear, um, <coughs> uh, fear, what's the word looking for, fulfilling, realizing, Aligning with, say aligning with. <coughs> All right, here's the example I give for this. And this is why I don't like this, because this is just anxiety. Anytime you're anxious, you're gonna remember things worse because your body is focused more on the threat. So you're, uh, you will be more stimulated, uh, but you're not focused on learning. You're focused on avoiding whatever the threat is. This is why uh, you, know, you come up to give a speech and if you have some anxiety, is your speech gonna be better or worse? worse. It's gonna be worse. I'm gonna remember less of it because I'm anxious. My body, my frontal lobe is not fully accessed. My limbic system's highly active. My stress response is going. So my body's not focusing on the task and recalling memory or memorizing. It's more concerned about whatever threat there is. So what they did was they took a bunch of um, uh, students 
uh, some of them were black, some of them were white, and then they reminded black students that they generally tend to do worse on tests. And what they found was they did worse than if they didn't tell them that. And I think this is the dumbest thing ever because it's like, okay, number one, who does that? All right, let's take a test, except you guys do worse historically on tests. Have fun. Like, no one does that in the first place. But second of all, it's not the stereotype that was important. What was important was they made them anxious, so it caused them to stress out and do worse. And you can do it with anything. It could be a stereotype that you're worried about fulfilling. It could be a, a specific performance thing, like this is a really important test and I have to do well, or, or else that's going to make you do worse. If someone highlights you and your performance, like you feel like someone's watching you, you're going to do worse. All these factors make it worse, but it's all the same thing. Uh, it's all based on stress and anxiety. So these students, for example, were uh, worried about not doing well because they were expected to, to not do well. Um, so they were stressed or upset or anxious about it. Um, so yeah, remember it's a test, I guess, and, and I guess it's relevant, but it really just means if you're anxious or stressed, you're gonna do worse because your cognition is, is uh, functions non-optimally, uh, as opposed to if you're just focused and there's nothing uh, bothering you as far as stress and anxiety goes. But, but do know it. Uh, if a group is, a person's afraid of uh, living up to a negative stereotype, they're going to do worse because they're anxious. You guys got that? Nice. We'll do the other ones tomorrow.